Okay, so we're delighted to have uh, Jacob Leshno from Colombia tell us about the economics of the Bitcoin payment system. Okay, thank you. Um, very happy to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that you all heard about Bitcoin. So uh, I just want to say um, what I want to like, tell you about Bitcoin. There's a lot of aspects to the system that you can think about. The way that I want to think about it is the payment system. So there's a new currency, there's a new coin, but a lot of people have been printing coins. The really novel like, innovation in Bitcoin is that it's an independent system. It's a system which is not controlled by anybody, it's fully decentralized, and it allows you to do the same kind of uh, transactions or provide the same kind of services as PayPal does or Fedwire. Like you can hold a balance in some, in some currency, and you can send the balance to some other people, so you can make transfers. Um, and the really big difference is that PayPal is operated by a company, Fedwire is operated by a company, they maintain the infrastructure, um, there's no such counterparty that operates Bitcoin. Okay? Bitcoin is kind of operates as a collective. Okay? So, um, okay, so I have to have a slide about like Bitcoin is Kind of serious, like those two things or three things from this slide. One is the Bitcoin market cap is pretty big, it's like a lot of billions of dollars. Uh, second, this is from September. Since then, Bitcoin went from 4,500 here to 19,000, and now it's about 9, 10,000, so it's incredibly volatile. Okay. So things move pretty quickly here. And the third thing that I want to show you is that it's not just about Bitcoin, there's a lot of different cryptocurrencies and each one of those cryptocurrencies is its own system and its own design and partly what we want to think about is how do you design those kind of systems okay. what are the kind of trade-offs so what does the system what is the system supposed to do you'll provide service to users just like PayPal does you want to hold an account have some balance and be able to transfer it to other uh, to other entities and generally, this is the kind of business where you think of natural monopolies. Because it's better for me to be in PayPal if all my friends are also on PayPal. And if a new technology comes up, but none of my friends use it, it's hard, like, it's hard for this technology to uh, gain market traction if nobody ever wants it. So in economic terms, like that will be a network externality that uh, makes this thing sort of a natural monopoly. Okay. So we may all be very happy to move to PayPal, but we know that once we move to PayPal, PayPal will have a strong grip on the market, it will be very hard for us to move to somewhere else. And that's kind of problematic, because uh, PayPal may want to increase the fees once it locked everybody in. Okay. And Bitcoin is going to be different, because in Bitcoin, you have some sort of protocol that connects users and some servers that provide the service, but nobody is controlling it. So the title of the paper, Monopoly Without a Monopolist, uh, does not, is not there to suggest that Bitcoin will become a monopoly. Far from it. But even if something like Bitcoin becomes a monopoly, it will not do some of the things that a monopolist does. Um, because the monopolist has full control of the system, they decide how many servers to deploy, how much to charge the users. But in Bitcoin, there's no such entity that can get to decide uh, how much to charge or how many servers to deploy. And what we're trying to do here in this paper is try to understand how all those decisions will get determined under the Bitcoin system. So you still need servers, you still need to charge users, um, you still need to pay the infrastructure that you're using. How is this payment going to be determined in Bitcoin? How are the servers going to be financed? And how many fi servers will the Bitcoin system decide to, to get? Okay. Okay. Um, so let me skip this and just say that what I'll do now is, uh, I'm guessing that a lot of people here are familiar with Bitcoin, but let me just go through a brief overview of, at a high level, how the system operates. From that, I will derive an uh, economic model that 
just focuses on the properties of the system, what does it mean for the way that we can uh, model the system as an economic system? And then we uh, will derive uh, some equations that will tell us what will be the prices that people will pay under Bitcoin, how efficient will this pricing scheme will be, and what does it mean for the design of the system? How can we think of designing different kind of Bitcoin systems to make them more efficient? Okay, so how does Bitcoin look like? So the first thing is that Bitcoin does not uh, store balances. It stores all the transactions uh, because it's much easier to update. If you want to update the ledger, you don't need to rewrite the transaction. You just append the transaction to the end. And that means that everybody can update by just appending the recent transactions to their ledger as well. Each transaction says, I am the owner of address X. I have 19.5 Bitcoin in this address. I want to send three of those Bitcoins to address Y and 16.4 into address Z. And quite importantly, I decide what is the transaction fee that I'm willing to pay for this transaction. So in the Bitcoin system, every time you send a transaction, you choose how much transaction fees you want to pay for this transaction. And now the ledger is just going to be a long list of all of those transactions organized into blocks. So think of a block as representing 10 minutes of transaction data. And if I know all the sequence of blocks, I can calculate what are the balances of everybody. And then I can see whether a new transaction is valid to make sure that the owner authorized this transaction. You have a cryptographic signature. And to make sure that the owner actually has the balance that he says he does, you can look at all the ledger and calculate that somebody actually gave him the money from a source that's valid. Okay. Okay. So now the big challenge that, uh, that Bitcoin or the blockchain uh, technology solved is how do I make sure that uh, I have many miners, many servers in the system, and that will all process transactions simultaneously and get to consensus about which transactions went through. And the way that it's done is that I'm going to have many servers. Each server is going to be called a miner. I'm going to make them all uh, participate in this um, kind of wasteful activity that will randomly select one of them. And at some level of abstraction, I can th think of all of them holding copies of the blockchain, transactions coming in to some pool of unconfirmed transactions that is available to everybody. And then I need to append those transactions to the ledger in a way that will maintain the consensus. So, um, so what I do, I select one of those miners at random. This Miner that's got selected gets to suggest what is the block that's going to be appended to the blockchain. He says, I got selected. I took some transactions from this uh, public mempool. I want to process those transactions. I will add them. I confirm that all of those are legal. So and this I'll get to this in a bit. This is. Um, and. You can think that every 10 minutes on average, it's not exactly every 10 minutes, it's a Poisson process of selection, but think of every 10 minutes, one of those miners will get selected, he gets to assemble the block, and that block is 10 minutes of transaction data. Uh, there's a limit on how much information, how many transactions you can put in this block. Um, so as of July, of this year, it was one megabyte. Now there's some amendments. It's different between different systems. But let's just think of this as being one megabyte or roughly 2,000 transactions per block. And this miner said, those are the transactions that I, uh, that I decided to process. He propagates it uh, to the rest of the miners. The rest of the miners validate that the block is actually legal, and that all the transactions that this miner wanted to put through are legal transactions. They have the signatures. They uh, they don't move balances uh, from accounts that didn't have balances to begin with. And once they 
all agree that this block is actually valid. They all reach consensus on this block. And then they can start mining the next block. And then another random miner will be selected for the next block and so on and so on. Okay. Okay. So because I have this random selection, I get that, uh, uh, that none of the miners are influential in the system. If I don't really need to pay attention to any one of those particular miners because the fact, the chance that he will get actually selected for those 10 minutes is very small. Okay? And even if he does something bad, he blocks my transactions, my transaction will just wait for the next block, which will just be processed as usual by another miner. Okay. Okay. So, um, so let me answer different questions and Yuval questions. So one is why would the miners do this? The miners do this for profit. We're not assuming that the miners are honest or that uh, or that the miners are benevolent in some way. The miners are totally here to make a profit, and the way that they make profit is that they get paid every time they get selected to mine a block. How do they get paid? In two ways. One is that the system allows them to have a special transaction that creates money from nothing and moves it to them. Okay? So basically printing money. And uh, this is currently the majority of the reward. So every block in Bitcoin, every 10 minutes, uh, the miner that mined the block is allowed to create 12 and a half Bitcoin and move it to their account. Um, but this is only a short-term reward. Okay? In the long term, this is going to go away. Every about four years approximately, the amount of Bitcoin you print per block is getting cut by, by half. When okay? was the last time this about two years ago, uh, it was 25 Bitcoin per block. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact date. But. So one question that's kind of started us thinking about this is what will happen once you half it? And at some point, after you half it enough times, you go below, beyond the floating point, and the reward per block becomes literally zero. Okay? Um, so what is the other source of compensation? The other source is those transaction fees that I mentioned, that the, whoever sends a transaction, the user can decide on how much transaction fees he wants to pay. Okay? Those are... Um, Oh, so those are the two sources that go to a miner. If you process a bunch of transactions, all the, all the transaction fees from those transactions go to you. So the, the user, just when he makes a transaction, he posts with it how much he's willing to pay. Yes. Okay. okay. And, and he might, in principle, be passed by one miner and says that's too low, and then another miner might take him. Or, yeah. if, or maybe if he offers too little, everyone will say, well, I don't want this guy. I'll just take other transactions. Yeah. So we will we'll analyze this exact game. Huh? How should you select your transaction fees? Um, okay, so your question, how do you select somebody at random? That's a very marvelous innovation of Bitcoin that um, we don't have any trusted authority. We don't have identities. How do we do random selection? Well, the answer is let's ask everybody to do hashing. And you'll hash and try to find a hash that has a low enough value. Basically, the only way that you can try to solve this is brute power, brute force. Um, if you do more hashes, your probability of finding one that's low is going to be higher. So let's just adjust the difficulty. How low do you need to go to be such that in collectively, we all together will find uh, a hash that's this low every 10 minutes on average? And then every time you find a hash that's low enough, you got the permission to mine a block. Okay? And that will be a Poisson process with an average arrival of once every 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the last thing is that you should also ask a lot of questions about, is this really an equilibrium for all the miners to accept other miners' block, build on top of them? Do also, should they, maybe they can do other shenanigans. Um, we're going to avoid this question for today and just assume that the system is working properly in equilibrium. There are some very nice papers. First by the original paper, this Nakamoto 2008 is the paper that introduced Bitcoin. Nakamoto is a pseudonym. Um, Yalen Sir is a very, I think, one of the nicest papers here that actually say that 
the original design is almost correct, but there's something that they uh, that they kind of ignore that you, that miners can exploit, but there's a, there's a fix for that. Basically, if all the miners are small enough, then it's equilibrium for all of them, to be honest, and follow what I described. Yes? Uh, for some process, is it an assumption, or is it actually this is the way the system is designed? Uh, it's... You repeatedly said that for some process, so it's... So the... You have the hash function, the difficulty of finding <clears throat> Um, so you have a lot of people trying to solve, okay, so to find a hash. Okay, so limit. Okay. So collectively, you can think that this approximately possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The assumption is that that there is nothing else you can do mm -hmm. than randomly random try. Random. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many people you have. The only thing they can do is to randomly try. It's a possible. Yeah. If they can do other things, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Oh. Um. Who knows what is that? So um, basically boiling those down to a few properties of the system that I'll use for a model. So you have users that choose their own transaction fees. Miners, I must, I'll assume they're all small, and the price takers in the sense that users do not care about what a particular miner does. A miner can, can say, I, I don't uh, process any transactions that are less than two Bitcoin, uh, give me less than two Bitcoin transaction fees. Nobody will respond because the chance that he's going to get selected is too small. Okay. Okay. So this is, this is really an assumption. Okay. Uh, we talk about this in the paper, and it's actually not, like, not that problematic, uh, but it is an assumption. Also, another abstraction, I'm going to assume that all the miners are symmetric. They have the same cost and the same ability. It's also false in practice, but it's a useful abstraction. Okay. Uh, and what will happen if you uh, generalize this will be uh, pretty normal dynamics of competition with competitive advantage. So like this. Um, we have free entry and exit of miners. A miner is not committed to the system. They can start mining. They can stop mining wherever they want. Okay. Um, in practice, if you want to start mining today, you may want to buy dedicated hardware, so there's some fixed cost. We're going to ignore that and just assume that there's uh, zero fixed cost and just the marginal cost of electricity that you want to mine. Yeah. Yes? Uh, can you please clarify that assumption a little bit? Do you mean that only the small miners are price takers, or do you mean that in your assumption that miners are small in general? I, I'm going to assume that all miners are small and, they're all, and therefore they're all price takers. Yeah. I see. That's not quite true, right? That's not quite true. I can talk about why this is still uh, a good assumption and a good way to analyze. And uh, the, in, an, in the sentence, once you have free entry, I don't really need this assumption, but it's just easier to explain when I, when I assume that everybody is small. No? No? So, uh... The really important assumption here is the free entry, not the not the fact that everybody is small. So, so as far as the protocol is concerned, there's free entry and exit of miners. Mm -hmm. But uh, the economics of real life, uh, people tend to invest in infrastructure, invest real money in hardware, yeah. and because of which they're compelled to stay mining to at least recover their costs if they have, in, if they have over investment, if they're not calculated the investments properly. So, so it really doesn't... There's a more complicated dynamic, and what it, I'm going to do here is a very simplified version. Um, but roughly, you can think of those results as roughly, uh, roughly holding. Not exactly, but roughly. Okay, I'll talk about it in a couple of slides. Okay. Um, and last, a very important property of the system is that the capacity of the system, the number of transactions the system can serve, is independent of how many servers or how many miners are in the system. Uh, so that's a bit of a weird property. I add more computational power to the system, but I don't add any more capacity. And the reason is that I just select one miner at random to process one block. It doesn't matter how many miners there are. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Um, okay. So, and this is, uh, the throughput is exogenously determined by some parameters in the protocol. Uh, the somewhat arbitrary parameters that Bitcoin had in July are one megabyte and ten minutes. Okay. Okay. So, 
in terms of an economic model, this translates, I will, we translate it to uh, this kind of model. We have capital and small minors. I'll think about this as a continuous number just for uh, making my life easier. Um, they all have equal computing power, equal cost of mining, CM per period of time. There's many potential miners and free entry and exit. A block is mined by one of the miners at the Poisson rate mu, mu being 10 minutes, let's say. And every time a block is mined, up to k transactions can be processed within the block. A miner can post a block with less than uh, the full number of transactions, but he has a limit on one megabyte. So let's say one megabyte is up to k transactions, and all transactions take the same amount of space. In practice, this is also in a simplification, but, you know. Um, what about the users? Users arrive also at the Poisson rate. This is really an assumption, okay? Um, but, you know, we need some arrival process for the users. We might as well assume Poisson to make our life easier. And we assume that the arrival rate of users is below the capacity of the system. So the cap total capacity of the system is uh, up to k transactions every at, at uh, rate mu. Okay? So k times mu is on average how many transactions the system can process per unit time. Okay? We assume that the average number of arrivals of transactions that arrive is less than that. So on average, the system has sufficient capacity to process everybody. Okay? Um, and this is intentional because I think this is the more interesting regime that the system can process all the transactions that come in. Okay. Um, I'm going to identify a user with a single transaction he wants to send. Every user that arrives has a single transaction. He can select what is that transaction fee he wants to bid. Okay. It's going to be some non-negative number B that he wants to bid. And users have some value for getting the transaction th through that I'm going to assume is just large enough. But they don't like getting delayed. They would like to be processed as quickly as possible. How much they dislike delay is heterogeneous. Some users have a low delay cost, some have a higher delay cost, and the distribution is known. Okay. Yes? You said that everything is uh, decentralized, like the random selection of the, of the miner. But what about setting these parameters? Like uh, mu, for example. Yeah, that I'm going to talk about this at the end. I'm going to think about how to set those parameters. But just technically, who sets them? Um, whoever designed the protocol in the beginning. But there are adjusters, like something. So then adjusting those protocols is a pretty difficult process because it's like, uh, it's like updating the Wi-Fi standard. Like we all need to agree to move to a different system with a new update. And if we want to adjust those parameters, we need to get to a new consensus on a new protocol, basically. So this mu is fixed for Bitcoin, so 10 minutes. So it's hard coded into the protocol, and people are very resistant to changing this. Because yeah. lambda, lambda, in fact, is increasing, and so you have to increase mu as well, right? So we'll, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Right? Okay. So for, for, for the first part, for like the next, I know, 10 slides or something, think of mu being fixed, lambda may change. Okay? So you may have a lot of congestion on the network, less congestion on the network, but the Bitcoin system will not change its parameters. Okay? Then we'll ask what if you could code something that responds to that. Okay? Yeah. So one thing that I might have missed in the model, so this looks like um, sim there is a lot of symmetry here in the, mm -hmm. the miners, but uh, previously you mentioned that there are some miners with more power yeah. And so, but so you're you're ignoring this. I'm, I'm ignoring that. Yeah, the implications will be pretty okay. uh, pretty straightforward once you know, okay. once if you want to include miners that are bigger or have some cost advantage, they'll make some profits in the normal like just like any other uh, company that has competitive advantage or cost advantage. Okay. Yeah? okay. Um, so. You basically, you need to analyze two sides here. You need to analyze what the, would the miners do and what will the users do. The miners are easier, so let's start with them. Um, okay. Um, oh, I should say, okay. So I have a couple of assumptions. One is when a user comes to post a transaction, they don't observe the queue. They know the steady state distribution, but not the particular state of the queue. This is mostly for tractability. 
Uh, second, that all the users want to be in the service, in service in the system. They have enough value to uh, want to participate. Um, and this is a reasonable assumption you'll see in a few slides. Uh, I'm assuming that there's no new coins that are being minted. The entire compensation to miners is fully from the transaction fees. You can include the block reward. Nothing really changes. Uh, and I'm going to assume that the system operates correctly throughout. Uh, so there's enough miners. The system works. It's trusted. All the users work. Uh, and under this assumption, I want to analyze how much will the users pay, how many miners will I have. So, okay. So now analyzing the miners, if I'm a miner, um, if I don't get selected, there's nothing I can do. Uh, if I do get selected, what will maximize my profits? Uh, I can assemble a block of up to k transactions. I should take the k highest paying transactions and ignore the rest. So basically, all the miners do the same thing. Okay? They all take the k highest fee transactions. Um, and what will be the revenue that each miner expects to get? Well, if all the transactions go through, the total amount that miners expect to receive is equal to the total amount that users uh, pay in expectation. Okay? And each miner expects to get 1 over n out of the total revenue because it's, it's going to be selected with 1 over n chance. So let's say that the revenue that uh, the users, uh, the total transaction fees that users post is this rev that I calculate from somewhere. Okay. Given that, the number of miners should so be such that the revenue divided by n is exactly equal to the cost of a miner. Okay. Every miner makes zero profits, because if this was bigger, then I'll have more miners wanting to join driving n up. If this was less, they'll have minor exiting, okay, driving n down. This can only be stable if this is exactly offset by the cost of mining. And I have zero, minor, um, zero profit for miners. And that basically says that the number of miners that I get is determined by the total revenue that the system has divided by the cost of mining. So if I want to know how much infrastructure is going to be deployed by the system, I just need to ask, how much am I paying the miners? Okay. Um, so is the zero profit assumption crazy? Um, do miners make zero profit or not? They invest in infrastructure and hardware. Um, so here's a paper that estimate that a paper from 2016 that uh, had some estimate of how much the, min the miners spend the total amount of all miners, how much do they spend on electricity cost, on hardware. Um, and back in October 2015, when they, did, they looked at the system and did the estimates, the system was processing about one and a half transactions a second. And the total amount spent by the entire Bitcoin network per transaction was about $6 that was spent in trying to just get the hash that will get you to be selected for mining a block. And some extra sm very small fee that was actually spent on actual validation of the, of the transactions. So the yeah? first row is electricity. So yeah, so this is electricity. This is depreciation of the hardware. Okay, they assume that the hardware is good for a year, something like that. Yeah. Um, and you get that $6 per transaction is kind of crazy. Right, that's that's very expensive per transaction. The reason is that the transactions, the people who posted the transaction were not paying the six dollars. Six dollar was coming mostly from the printed Bitcoin. Okay. And now uh, this gives you the cost per transaction. This column gives you what would be the cost of transaction if we scaled up the system and things will become more efficient. You can see it's still pretty high. It's more favorable, but it's still pretty high. And now we can take those numbers and compare how much uh, they paid versus how much they earned. So in total, if you take those numbers and calculate per uh, uh, the <coughs> per 10 minutes, 
In total, the entire Bitcoin network spent about $6,000. Okay. And at that time, the reward was entirely from uh, the, the, from the print, printing of new Bitcoin. Transaction fees were essentially zero. Okay. And at that, uh, at that point in time, the, each block got 25 Bitcoin, which was, had a market value of about $300. And translating to dollars because the costs are in dollars. The cost of the miners are at Christie, that's cost in dollars. So the reward in dollars was something like $7,500. Okay. So they're not doing exactly zero profit. But you can see that ballpark seems like zero profit is not a terrible approximation. Okay. So that's, that's what I mean. Okay. 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 And here's a picture of what mining looks like. Big warehouses with a lot of machines. The Dutch just do a lot of hashing very quickly. Okay. Okay. So that tells me what do the miners do, how many miners there will be. Now I need to solve for how much uh, will the users actually pay. Okay. And that's a bit of the I think the more interesting part also, because in Venmo or PayPal or other systems you have a monopolist that sets a price. Here we don't have anybody setting the price. We just created such system. And now the question is, will anybody actually pay anything? How much will they pay? Will we be able to extract any, anything from the users to finance the system? Yeah. So let's think of uh, what we got from the equilibrium of miners. Each one of the miners, um, each one of the miners now looks at <coughs> the k highest transactions and processes them. So essentially what happens is that the users play congestion queuing game. Yeah? I don't really care how many miners there are, because yeah? one of them is going to be selected in front of them. Whoever gets selected, they're all going to do the same thing. So basically, I have a game where blocks are mined at rate mu. Each block will process the k highest free transactions. Yeah? So it's as if I can bid for priority. If I pay a higher transaction fee, I get more priority in getting processed. And now in equilibrium, we want to ask, what is this equilibrium of congestion queuing gain? Yeah. Yeah. Like each user will have a trade-off between how much they bid and how much is the uh, delay cost. Yeah. So the utility of a user will have some value for service R, that hopefully makes the entire thing positive some delay cost that depends on what is my cost per unit delay. What is my delay given that I bid B and the distribution of bids is given by G, the equilibrium distribution of bid is G. Yeah. Uh, and this function will say what is the expected delay okay, given the stationary, uh, the stationary distribution of, of the system. And then I have to also pay my bid. Okay. So if I bid higher, this will make me pay more, but I'll have less delay cost. Okay. So how does this look? So the delay depends basically just on how many people come and cut ahead of me in line. There's basically two kinds of people, people who bid less than me. I don't even see them because I cut ahead of them. I don't care how many of them there are. There's the people who bid more than me, they cut ahead of me. So what I care is how many people arrive that will have higher priority than me? Okay. Um, because, <coughs> um, because people with higher delay cost will want to cut, uh, cut through the line more, you'll get that uh, basically a standard argument will give you that the bid must be increasing in the delay cost. People who are more sensitive to delay get higher priority. Um, so the rate at which higher priority people arrive is basically how many people have a higher delay cost than you. Oh, sorry, why is this? Yeah, how many people have a higher delay cost than you? That's this f of bar of c. Yeah? And basically the parameter that you want is the congestion parameter, like what is the ratio between arrivals to the capacity of the system, multiplied by only the fraction that's above you. Okay, and that's the relevant congestion parameter for you. And your expected delay is basically a function of this, of 
your uh, congestion parameter given uh, your place in the distribution of cost. Okay? So what is W sub k? So how long will you wait when blocks are of size k? Yeah? Um, also, inside here, there's... Uh, actually, this does not depend on mu. Yeah? This expression does not depend on mu. This is how many blocks will you have to wait if each block is of size k? And the congestion parameter, the, the effective load of people that have higher priority than you is this raw times uh, your place in the distribution. And this translated to from okay. arrivals in blocks to waiting time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so now each agent will optimize this, and then we can just solve for the first order conditions and just get an expression. We can also uh, do some analysis and try to get what is this expected delay um, using just hearing formulas. Uh, Basically, it's like a multi-queue, uh, multi-server kind of queuing system. Right? It's a batch processing. Batch, with batch, batch processing batch. queue. Okay. So the fact that it's batch processing, like that's the previous slide, while we have some expression, okay. and those expressions are pretty nice. Uh, you need to find a root to a polynomial to actually calculate this, but Mathematica actually calculates it very nicely, and we I'll, I'll show you graphs in, a, in the next slide, I guess. Um, the more high-level interesting thing is that the amount that the user pays is actually exactly equal to the externality imposes on other transactions. So in equilibrium, the amount, uh, the congestion, the delay that each user suffers is an efficient result of uh, efficient assortment of priority. People that have higher delay get higher priority. And they pay exactly the externality. So it's as if you sold priority in a VCG auction. Um, so that's actually pretty nice. Uh, or you can think it's an efficient assignment of priorities in the system. Um, the thing is that your externality will depend on the overall congestion in the system. Uh, if there's a lot of congestion in the system, you impose a much bigger externality on other users. Uh, so here's the delay cost for the, uh, this is the expected delay for the user with the lowest priority. Uh, and now if you bid, if the user with the lowest priority would bid a bit higher, it would just cut uh, from getting this delay to a bit lower delay. Uh, and this is also tells you what the externality is going to be. It's going to move some people a bit higher in the margin. You can see that it's very flat here. It very, gets very convex. It's standard queuing uh, intuition. Um, and because it gets very convex here, people will wait a lot and will pay a lot when the congestion parameter gets closer to one. Huh? Um, so here's how much people will pay. It's a graph of how much people will pay, assuming that the distribution of delay cost is uniform, 0, 1. <coughs> Each line is an agent with a different delay cost. And the x-axis is what the overall congestion in the system is. If the congestion is low, basically nobody pays. If the congestion is very high, people start paying a lot. Okay. Okay. So let's skip this. So what does it mean um, for this kind of system? Is this good? Um, so it's good in some ways. There's some things that are very nice about this system. One is no transactions are excluded. So if you have a firm that tries to uh, maximize profits, usually, usually they'll increase the price until some people go away, go to another, uh, another alternative. In this case, we don't care about the value of agents. All the agents may have very high value, very high surplus from using the system. We're not excluding anybody. And moreover, even if you pay zero to the system, we still process you. Yeah? We much just make you incur delay. Yeah? So on a social perspective, this is actually something very appealing for the system. It's kind of the opposite of what you'll get if you set up a monopolist to run this. Yeah? If you pay actually no fee, then why would the... Because the Lambda is still less than uh, whatever came So he can, range. but he's not necessarily motivated unless... No, so usually there will be a block with less than k transactions yeah. other than yourself. So even yeah. if you're paying whatever. 
So you can have a system. Yeah, you can have a system where, um, where not some people are sensitive to delay and they pay and they finance the system, and the people who are not sensitive to the delay not, don't need to pay anything. So, in in a sense, if you want to think about a financial system that's widely accessible, okay, this is a pretty nice property, right? You allow everybody to access, but you discriminate on the speed of transaction. You let everybody participate, but still make it bad enough to participate for free that some people will be willing to pay. Yeah. Um, so you get that um, all users can have a strictly positive net surplus. Um, and even if the system is a complete monopoly, even if we all looked in to use Bitcoin, we basically have no alternative, you still don't get rent extraction here. Like the prices will not rise if this is all a monopolist. Basically, the system is committed to serve us at those prices. Yeah? But if the cost of the miner starts to exceed what they're getting, getting from there, so you'll have less miners. That's okay, so the number of miners will depend on the revenue that you can get from the system, but the system kind of fixed in the protocol. What are the pricing rules here? Okay? <clears throat> the caveat here that the they fix the, the pricing, but they fix the pricing to be something that's a function of the delay. So if there's very little delay, we're going to get very little revenue. That may be too little, and that may be disastrous for the system. If we get too much delay, we may get too much revenue, and that's not good either. So, yeah. So a question, what happens in a very lightly loaded system in which uh, maybe... Okay, so I'll get to this in a couple of... Okay, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So we'll, we'll save the long questions to the end. So I'll, I'll get to this in a bit, OK? So this, this is, in a way, appealing because like, you get some protection of consumers in a way that monopolists will not give you. Okay. Uh, now, I guess you all alluded to the question, is this sustainable? Will this actually work? Okay. So I need to do the accounting and see what is the revenue that I'm actually getting from this entire system? The revenue must be sufficient to fund enough miners. Okay. Um, so I have some expression here that gives me what is the total revenue generated by the system per unit time. And as we said before, given if I have the revenue, I know how many miners I get. The other thing I need to account is that I impose delay cost on users. So in order to make the people that are sensitive to delay pay, I need to make those who don't pay wait a lot. And that's costly. That's costly to make people wait. That's inefficient. So I also want to count what's the delay cost. So let's, uh, this is the theoretical graphs for both of those expressions. They both start from zero. If the system is not congested at all, nobody waits and nobody pays. And as the system becomes more congested, people pay more, and there's more delay cost that wastes people's time. Well, for, yeah? Uh, yeah? Is delay cost at the point one or point two level? Yeah. Because at point one and point two, or low enough levels, it's hard to impose delay. Selfish people won't do that. Uh, so people. So how did it separate so fast? So. The delay here goes up because even if I'm processed for sure in the next block, I have to wait for the next block. I do understand that, but if a miner has room in his block, yeah. and he should strategically not process it to make sure that people don't start paying less. But the, each miner is very small. Oh, so you're assuming this is this is already even if 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 there's an available room, he will get processed. Yeah. Period. Yeah. So no strategic delay, and yet there is enough separation there? Um, I, I, what do you mean by enough separation? I mean, if the system is very underserved, and I saw point oh one, point it, one was I, very underserved. Yeah. Underserved. I mean, there, there's just there may, may more potential for managing transactions than the number of transactions. Because yeah, so... You can, in, you can process two kilobytes. So you can see the revenue... And, the, and apparently, not two kilobytes, but 200 whatever those bytes are coming, like a third factor of 10 less. Yeah, so you can so see that nobody pays. Mean? The total revenue is essentially zero. Yeah. But why is the delay cost on zero? I think it's because people still really have to wait for the next block. Okay? So, so if you have... That's not fair in some sense. 
So oh. if you get processed in the very first block that you could have been processed. Oh, I see. That's a straight line up there. Really but, 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 but this is a straight line up. Yeah. So it just, like, there's no actual... Yeah. No, and, it should be a fit. No, I don't understand. So you, should, you, should, you need, still need to wait for the first block to arrive. And that's relevant because you can think of having frequent blocks in, in, and having infrequent blocks. Huh? But you fix the frequency, right? You no, fix you didn't. So I said this is a parameter mu. Huh? But in all it's, this, is, mu is fixed. Yeah. And the slope will depend on mu. No, I don't understand. But this is why is it not flat? Is this the total delay cost or the delay cost per user? It's the total delay cost. That's why it's not. No, it should be flat. No, oh. it should be linear. Oh, so, because it's twice because as many it's, it's looking, it's not normalizing by users. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I see. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, huh? okay I got it. Okay. okay. Um, so let me, like, okay. So we can show that both of those things are increasing with the congestion parameter. Uh, I think this is the m more interesting slide where the black curve is, again, the revenue the same one that I had before. This is what comes out of our model, where we just plugged in uh, the distribution of delay cost to be uniform between 0 and 0.1, just eyeballing, um, and k to be 2,000 transactions. And then we get this curve. The blue dots are uh, empirical data, where we took days on the Bitcoin network. And for each day, we calculated what is the total revenue divided by number of blocks, so what is the total revenue per block from transaction fees, yeah. uh, versus what is the average, uh, the average size of a block. So what percent of the blocks during the day were, uh, how, how full the, were the blocks were during that day. And the percentages will be between 0 and 1, yeah, or the average size of the blocks will be 0 to 1 megabyte. Okay, 1 megabyte saying that all the blocks today were full. Okay. Uh, 100k means that they were 10% full. So this gives us a measure that we interpret as congestion. So we align those two things together. And we can see that during the days where the blocks on average were pretty empty, indeed, nobody paid. In the days where blocks were starting to get pretty full, like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, there's still, on average, there's it's, it's some excess capacity on the blocks. But people start paying already. That's what you get from the queuing model that because of randomness, maybe just because the time that I came, there was some temporary congestion, and therefore I wanted to pay more to get ahead of this block, even though there's enough capacity for everybody. <coughs> and like the queuing, once you approach 100% utilization, so you... there's a lot of websites that give you this information. And if I, uh, I have an app that has some Bitcoin, I'm not invested in Bitcoin, I just have a bit to sort of be able to credibly talk about this. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the apps that maintain your Bitcoin, they will actually tell you if you want to uh, get your transaction processed in the next hour, this is how much I estimate you need to pay. If you want to have it processed in the next 10 minutes, you probably need to pay more, and you, your apps will give you some estimates of this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that what we do is not crazy, and it kind of shows that uh, really, the congestion is really driving up the fees. There's been a lot of dynamics over the Bitcoin network. So for the last six months or something, the transaction fees were very high. A year ago, they were essentially zero. Now they're back to being pretty low again, and it moves with the transaction volume. Yeah. Um, so again, what does it mean? Some uh, positives and negatives. One is that... Um, all the miners provide the infrastructure basically at cost because there's free entry. We have a lot of miners that are competing with each other and they're providing uh, the service basically uh, at cost. Um, the revenue determines the infrastructure level, but you get that the revenue varies with the congestion. So the number of miners that we're going to have from the system varies without any regard for whether we need more miners or not. Uh, it just depends on the congestion level. Yeah. And one very problematic scenario, as you already pointed out, is suppose we have no delays, then we have no revenue. We have no revenue means that the miners leave. The miners leave, that doesn't create congestion. Because okay. even if we have a few amount of miners, the capacity stays the same. And the only thing it can make is make the system less reliable. 
which in turn should lower the demand for the system and lower the congestion further. So you can think this is a potentially downward spiral for the system. Um, there's some reason why you shouldn't get it. Um, that some miners will, may have a stake, that they will be willing to continue mining anyway, but this is a very problematic uh, aspect of this pricing mechanism. And some, there's a lot, bunch of other costs in this, in this design. So one is there's a lot of redundancies in the work that the miners have to do. The tournament that does the random selection of miners is very, uh, is very wasteful. Okay? So it generates uh, random selection, which is pretty hard to generate in other ways. So it serves a purpose, but it's pretty costly to do. Okay? Um, you must have delay cost to get anybody to pay. Um, the infrastructure level may not be optimal, and we just talked about this potential instability. Okay? So in the last five minutes, what I want to talk is, can we do anything by just adjusting mu and k? So suppose that this lambda, this arrival of transactions, can vary over time. And suppose I can respond in some way and just adjust how frequent are the blocks and how big are the blocks to address this to get my target revenue. So we do some, uh, some analysis. And basically what we show is that once the block are, blocks are big enough, the system kind of looks very similar. The behavior of the system can be uh, analyzed almost uh, for all large sizes of the blocks at once. Yeah. And what you get is that the revenue when the congestion is very low, when the congestion is close to zero, the revenue is going to be of very low order, but the delay costs are going to grow linearly. Yeah? And that's, again, the total delay cost and the total revenue. It's not normalized by the amount uh, of agents. Yeah? So that means that the system is going to be very inefficient at raising low amounts of revenue. Yeah? So. We can think of fixing, uh, fixing the block size and changing the frequency of the blocks to adjust the, the, adjust the congestion parameter. And then we have this parametric curve that we can travel on. Well, I want to travel on this plane where on the x-axis I have my revenue. On the y-axis I have my delay cost. If I set my congestion to zero, I start from this point, I have zero delay cost for everybody and zero delays. Uh, as zero delay cost, sorry, and zero revenue. As I increase my congestion parameter, I'll start traveling upwards in both of those dimensions. My delay cost will go up and my revenue will go up. Okay? And what we are interested in, how will they go up? You can see that at the beginning, I just increased my delay cost and my revenue stays flat. flat. Okay. Once I get to some significant delay cost, then I start getting uh, the, this curve is, uh, curves uh, to become very uh, concave. Okay. So it starts from being, being very flat, and as I'm talking, it becomes flat. And the shape of this thing is kind of the opposite of what you would want to get. So this means that if I want to raise a low amount of revenue, actually needs substantive delay cost. And once I have some amount of revenue, it's easy to get much more yeah, without much more delay cost. I would like to have uh, an easy time to get the necessary amount of revenue to fund the system and make sure that I don't get more than that by accident. But I get this inefficiency. And if I put in the block size, I get that if I look at different sizes of block, the curves that I get are just a scaled version of the same, of the same curve. Okay, so here the vertical axis delay costs are logarithmic. The revenue is still linear. Um, and you can see that basically I always want to take uh, smaller blocks. Okay, if I look at the curve of how much delay cost do I need to impose on the users to raise a certain amount of revenue? No? The answer is, if I have a lower block size, I can raise this revenue for a lower amount of delay cost for users. No? 
basically that says if you want to adjust the parameters, and you can either make more frequent blocks or make the blocks bigger, it will be better to adjust the blocks to be smaller. Okay. Um, and still, you'll get that the system is going to have to impose some significant delay cost on users to raise any revenue. Okay. So, okay. so uh, I guess I'm out of time. Yeah. The limit on? What's the unit on the uh, y axis? So both are in dollars. Both, both are dollars. Dollars per time. Yeah. Oh, because you had a conversion for time as point one. A one. uniform, like they have a distribution. Oh, what was it? Uniform. So I think here it's uniform zero one. Oh. The per minute per hour? Or? I just want to translate that into an actual time of how long does it take to process? Um, you should be able to roughly translate. I think it. multiply by 2 and uh, multiply by five. 2 and per 10 minutes. Perfect. So the units are per 10 minutes. I think the units we use are per block time. Okay. Yeah. So there's okay. another time parameter in your system that you're not somehow mentioning is that um, there has to be enough time between subsequent blocks that the miners can coordinate to make sure it's identical. Yeah. So if you make the, the blocks very frequent, then uh, well, it's just not going to work. Like, yeah. there's some real limits out there. So we'll, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a great comment. This is abstracting from technological constraint. This is if we could set the parameters however we wanted, this is what we want. No. So that says that Try to find a design that makes the blocks more frequent, and it may be better to push in this dimension and try to find other ways we can design those cryptocurrency systems to try to uh, push how frequent we can make the blocks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so let me just like wrap up. So we think that um, we think that there's uh, innovation in Bitcoin, not just in terms of the technology, but also in the economic landscape that it generates. It generates a system that is committed to some protocol, doesn't have an owner. That is a lot of positive things. If you think of somebody committing not to raise prices, it also has a lot of challenges because you think that the pricing may need to adapt over time. And there's some uh, questions of how to, uh, how to adapt for this. Uh, congestion as a revenue generator mechanism is, has some Classes and minuses. I think it's interesting to look at this, um, but there's still a question of what kind of other rules can you generate here. So this is one example of the rules that were set up in Bitcoin. Um, you can think of many other rules that you can implement. It's not that you can do anything because it's still a decentralized system, but I can't. I think it's very uh, interesting to explore whether there's better mechanisms to try to find revenue generating mechanism for those cryptocurrency systems. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes? I really like the world, um, this uh, uh, connection with um, game theory and, and, and queuing, queuing games. Um, but what, one question here, I mean, the key assumption here is that the delay costs are, are basically a key factor here in the model. And I wonder in practice, I mean, how realistic it is. Let's say, for example, I want to make a transaction with Bitcoin. Is it really, does it really matter? Maybe I'm making such a, a big transaction in terms of the volume that I don't really care if I have to wait for a certain amount of time. Is it really something that you believe is, is key in these kind of systems? So the model allows some users to care and some users not to care. I understand, but it's... And they think this is... This is a... This is realistic, right? You can tell me that the distribution should look differently than what we assume. So by no means, I think that the uniform zero one delay cost is anywhere close to being correct. But I think that yes, there are users who want the transaction to be processed more quickly. Like if you're paying, nobody's paying at a restaurant for Bitcoin, but if you were paying at a restaurant for Bitcoin and you had to sit there until the transaction go through, you know, probably more time sensitive than if you're sending uh, some Bitcoin to your friend, because you owe me money for last night's dinner. What time scale are you thinking about here? Is it like wait more, wait less? It's like it's a question of seconds, minutes. I'm just curious. I mean, so right now, transactions on Bitcoin can wait 10 minutes for the next block, so they can wait two days. 
No. 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 So it seems to just now I'm thinking what really matters is this k times mu because that's the capacity of the cube. Mm -hmm. But you seem to indicate that it's not just the product. It matters whether you know, increase or decrease k or mu. Yeah. Where is that coming from? Uh, can you give me some intuition? So I, I don't have a great intuition for this, but uh, but I can give you this hand wavy kind of story. Let's suppose I take a block of a thousand transactions and I cut it to many hundred transaction blocks. Mm -hmm. now, when I had a thousand transaction block, I didn't care where I am inside the thousand. When I cut it to many hundred transaction blocks, now I care. Am I in the first hundred or the second hundred or the third? So I create basically more incentives to compete for the top places. Um, so this is not like not a great explanation, but this is kind of hand, hand wavy. This is because of this batch processing as opposed to let's say if it was a um, like identical servers, the K mu servers thing, then it, yeah. this would not matter yeah. because of the batch. So again, goes to this. You're, you're measuring the cost even to wait till the very first block itself. It's the same. Yeah. So I, think we'll, so I think we'll have to finish here and continue offline. So Jacob is here until Saturday. Yeah. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.